Hi there, this is session six of programming from the very basics using Python. And uh, we will continue with ingredients of a Python program, continuing from session five. In the last session, I talked about um, integers mostly. I think I talked about uh, literal notation of integers and I told you about uh, uh, various features related to integers that's got to do with arithmetic expressions. And uh, I also told you uh, how you can represent integers in different formats hexadecimal, octal, and decimal format, and also the binary format. We will continue in this video. Mostly, I'll plan to cover more on the overview on other data types that are supported in Python, the built-in data types, moreover. And I'll also talk about conversion between types using various type constructors or the data types. I'll also try to cover on getting user input. And last, I will also tell you more about print function if time permits in this video plan to make it in one hour, but let's see how it goes. All right, then uh, to begin, I should talk about uh, the data types in Python. We have already seen creating integers where you say a is equal to 10, this is an integer. I could say b is equal to 3.4, there's a float. c is equal to 4 plus 5j when I say this is a complex number. So when you try to print a, I'll print all the types here, type of a, type of b, and type of C. I talked about the type construct in the previous session. Uh, this will return the type of an object that you pass as a reference, as an argument. And uh, this is the output that you get when you run this code. You can see that A is an integer, B is a float, and C is a complex number. Uh, there's also another type which falls together in one category. That's D is equal to, let's say, true, for example. So what is this true, you might wonder? This is a reserved identifier. It's a reserved keyword, but works like an identifier. I'll talk about that now. So when you say type of D, it shows up as type bool. So it's a Boolean type. There's a new type which I now introduce in this session. Uh, Booleans are returned by Boolean expressions. So if you use any Boolean expressions, mostly comparison expressions, they return true or false. Right? So I'll talk about this in a while, just hang in there. So all of these types fall into one category and these are called as numbers. I can call it as numeric types. A little strange here is that if you come from other programming language backgrounds like Java especially, uh, you'll see that Boolean in Python is treated as some kind of a number. Yeah, it is. It's got to do with the history of Python. In the very early days of Python, there was no Boolean type, the Python 1.0, 1.5 days, right? There was no Boolean data type. So you would treat any expression that returns a value one or any value that's other than zero as true, as, as true in Boolean context. Um, if at all you have any expression that returns zero, you will consider that as false. So most of the comparison operators in the early days used to return zero or one in the Python 1.0 days, right? 1.0, 1.5 days. The earliest version of Python I used was Python 1.5 at the time. Um, there was no Boolean type. But then Boolean came up as a new type in Python 2, more as a, um, I could say, it's just a syntax sugar on top of integer. So a value one is represented as true and value zero is represented as false. And to say that this is a different type altogether, they just create Boolean as just a workaround for ones and zeros shown as true and false. What I'm trying to say here is this. Uh, if you try to print true here, or false, in Python 3 onwards, these are called as reserved identifiers. I mean, they identify some object. This true identifies an object. Uh, and that object represents a value one. But when you print it, rather than printing the value as one, it prints the value in a string format as true. There's a string representation of true. There's a string representation of false, right? So uh, the result of this Boolean is mostly to do with comparison. Suppose if I try to say, uh, let's be talk about comparison operators here. I'll talk about basic comparison operations for now. I'll go more detailed about Boolean logical operators and so on. Again, these are expressions, right? 
I could write, I could say maybe five is less than 10. This is a less than operator. This is nothing new in Python. You would have encountered these kind of operators if you worked on any other programming languages, mostly C, C, C++, Java, all languages use this kind of an operator, right? When you try to say five less than 10, you can see it returns a value as true, right? You can actually store that written value. Maybe you can say R is equal to five less than 10 and you can say print R type of R, you can see the result here. This is an expression. So all expressions can be used in a right hand side of an assignment. I think I talked about that in the earlier sessions, right? So when I use this expression, the outcome of this expression is a Boolean value. A Boolean value can either be true or false. Now, true is just a synonym for one. You'll see that. I'll demonstrate that in a while. But now just see. Well, let me talk about all the comparisons, right? So if I less than 10, <clears throat> you can try all other kind of comparisons. What are the other comparisons that you can use? I'm just going to print something like, so I can say 5 double equal to 5.0. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. You can see that. 5 has an integer, 5.0 is float. Numbers can be compared, irrespective of what type of numbers they are. You can largely compare them. Right. There are some caveats when you want to compare with floating point, you'll have some round off errors. That's something that you should be wary about. Right. That's got to do with the limitations of computing as such the computer CPU. Right. So uh, let's not worry about that for now. You can see that it shows up as equal equals. And uh, if I try to say five greater than uh, uh, two, it is true. If I try five um, greater than uh, uh, 10, that will be false. Right. I can try five not equal to six. Obviously that's true. I can try five less than or equal to um, maybe six. That'll be true. And I can say try five greater than or equal to um, four. It's also true. You can see the result of this is true. The result of this expression, five greater than five greater than two is also true. Five greater than 10 it's false because five is not greater than 10. You can see that it shows up as false. Five not equal to six. This is read as not equal to the exclamation equal to is not equal to, right? In early days of Python, I think you could also use less than greater than together supported in languages like basic, GW basic, basic, uh, visual basic and uh, ESP.NET perhaps. So if you've been using those languages, use that not as less than greater than. That was supported till Python 2, but I think in Python 3 onwards, they dropped that support. They only support exclamation equal to as a means of checking not equal to. And you have five less than equal to. Less than equal to is like check whether the left hand operand is less than or equal to the right hand operand. So in this case, this will written true, both if left hand operand is five, right hand operand is also five, the written value is true, you can see that, no change. But the moment you, make the right hand operand as uh, smaller than it written false, right? That you can see here. Uh, but then if it's uh, uh, five is less than less, equal to six, even then it shows up as true. The same goes with greater than or equal to. So these operators, what are the operators I talked about? Double equal to, that's for checking equality of values of two objects, right? And not equal to, that's the opposite of equal to. And less than, greater than, less than equal to, and greater than equal to. All these operators are called as comparison operators. And when you use them in expressions, these are called as Boolean expressions because it's doing a comparison. And when you're comparing it, the result is always true or false. That's why it's called Boolean expressions. All Boolean expressions return true or false as their outcome. Now let's try this. What if I try one double equal to two? Left hand operand is an integer one. Right hand operand is a Boolean true. True. Which actually means that true is equivalent to one. Now, right? Uh, if at all I try zero equals true, it's false. You might wonder why this parenthesis came. I will talk about that a little later, another session. Okay. That's a tuple, by the way. So this is what happens when you have comma separated. Uh, uh, you know, elements in a, an expression. But for now, I'll use print to avoid any extra confusion. And see the outcome here. 
and if you try even say zero double equal to false, it shows true. So you can consider that false, Boolean type false, a Boolean object whose value is false is equivalent to zero. And Boolean object true is equivalent to integer one, right? If you try with anything else, Definitely, you cannot compare with anything else. For example, if you try to say, uh, um, you know, print um, one in quotes, okay, double equal to true. What do you think is the answer? False. It's not a string, right? True cannot be compared with a string. They're not comparable. When they can't compare with each other, then obviously they might return false in this case. But then you can compare them with integers one and zero. So think of true is just a synonym for a value one. When you print that value though, instead of printing the value as one, it will print it as true. That is the only difference. So likewise, false is a synonym for zero, but when you print it as a string, it will print it up as false. That's what you see here. And these that you see here, these are reserved keywords now. This was not the case in Python 2. You could do strange things like you can reassign to them. This is now a reserved identifier keyword. So which means that this is a keyword. When I use a key, when I say the word keyword, these have reserved use cases. There are a lot of keywords in Python, right? A little bit of D2 right now. Sorry about this. So you know, always <laughs> D2 back and forth. Let me just bring up a terminal here. I'm just gonna go to the Python prompt. I've used the Anaconda prompt here. So if you're using Windows, you can use Anaconda prompt and type Python like I did here. In this Python prompt, you can get a lot of help right here. The initial days when I was journeying with Python, everything I learned was for self-learning and self-exploration. You know, it's a hard way, but that's how I learned it. So to type help here, open close parenthesis, help is a built-in function in Python. This works very well in a standard Python REPL. Do not work very well on a Jupyter notebook interface. It's a little interactive, so the interactive command like help is not well implemented in Jupyter Notebook. You can try it out, but you'll see it's a little weird, right? But when I say help open close parenthesis at the Python prompt, right? You can see it shows up a help system. This launches what we call as a help utility. And now the prompt is changed to a help prompt. If you want to exit the help prompt, just press enter one more time. It just exits. It says you're now leaving help and returning to the Python interpreter. So if you want to ask for a particular help on a particular object, blah, 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 it tells you all these details, right? So I'll tell you how to use the help utility. Let me clear the screen. Uh, or if you're using Linux or Mac OS and you're running a Python program inside, Python interpreter here, Python shell, you can always use the shortcut as control L, control L to clear the screen. This might not work on Windows, unfortunately. Uh, I guess it works if you use IPython on Windows. I need to check that. Okay, I didn't do that. I have not launched my Windows VM to verify. Forgotten. But then you can try it out. So Control L will clear the screen. Okay. So once you have done, once I clear the screen, now I'll type help one more time. Now when you have the help prompt, we can type topics. What topics are available for help? All of these are different topics. So you can look at all these topics. We can look at, let's look at comparison. It's an interesting one. See, comparison. Let's type comparison here. Not sure if the, it is case sensitive. I'm go, anyway going to type it in capital letters. It tells you, unlike C, all comparison operations in Python have a same priority, which is lower than that uh, of the arithmetic and shifting and bitwise operations. Also, unlike C, expressions like A less than B less than C have the interpretation of a conventional, uh, that is conventional mathematics. Uh, there are some details over here. It may not look very beginner friendly because it assumes that you already know about comparisons in other languages, but it gives you some syntax grammar here. This is a, basically called a syntax grammar that you see here. Official syntax grammar on how you can use comparisons and so on. So it's quite detailed. It tells the operators less than, greater than, double equal to, greater than equal to, all of these are used for comparing values of the objects. And it says that objects do not need to have the same type. I mean, you can compare a float with an integer. It does not throw any error. It might either return true or false based on the value comparison, right? That's what it does. Types can be anything. As long as the value representation objects can be compared, you can use these operators. They're very flexible, right? That's what 
Boolean uh, comparisons are in Python. Uh, you can see that uh, this help system gives you a lot of details about different topics. For now, if I want to get help on the keywords, that's why I opened the help for, you can just type keywords here. All of these, what you see here, the list of reserved keywords in Python. So each of these keywords are used as a part of a statement. Some of them are statement keywords like if, del, assert, break, continue. I think I covered that in the previous session when I just gave a list of simple statements, right? So most of them start with the keyword, right? That's what they are. And there are certain keywords which are used as a part of expressions like I can look at in, is, or, and, not. These keywords are part of expressions. Keywords like if can be used in expressions also. Lambda is also an expression keyword, by the way. Uh, but there are some keywords which you can see here, starting with capital letter, like false, none, and true. These three keywords that you see on top are called as reserved identifiers. Why these are called keywords and what do you mean by that? Which means that you cannot create an identifier with the same name as this keyword. The keywords are treated differently by the Python parser. And Python is parsing your program. If it sees this keyword, it treats it differently, which means that if you try to do that, something like this, if is equal to 100. Okay, I'll show it in the outside help, okay? Outside help. If is equal to 100. Do you see a problem? If I say P is equal to 100, it'll work. P is not a reserved keyword. So you cannot create an identifier in Python with the same name as a keyword. So you cannot even do things like say, true is equal to zero. It doesn't work. You cannot assign to true. This is an identifier. See, true is used like an expression. It returns a value, true. False, returns a value, false. None, returns a value, none. Actually, that return value is not printed by the REPL. The REPL won't print it, but when you say print of none, you get the output. Whenever there's REPL, this read, evaluate, print loop, evaluates an expression, and the expression's return value is equal to none, it will not print anything. But if you want to explicitly print it, you can always use print function to print it. So it looks like this is a keyword. When you ask what does it return, it returns a string, a string. That's the same, uh, you know, what to say, it's got, it's got the same uh, words as the keyword itself, right? It looks like true returns true, false returns false, none returns none. That's it, okay? These are desert keywords. And you cannot you reassign to these identifiers. Think of them like constants in a way. Predefined constants in Python. They're fixed. You cannot change them, right? So they made them as reserved keywords in Python 3 onwards, and so they are. I said Python 3. In Python 2, you can, uh, if you ever happen to use Python 2, try this. You try true is equal to zero and all hell will break loose in your Python code, <laughs> right? So everywhere you're trying to check for true, true will no longer be true, it'll be equal to zero, and it can become false, right? That is possible in Python 2. Python 3, they restricted it, and they made true, false as reserved keywords. So they identify true object, they identify false object, and none identifies an object called none to represent nothingness. So this is what you should know. Now, if I, in the help system, to know about all the keywords, you can just type keywords here. You just type help, open close parenthesis, by the way. So help is a function. So you type help, open close parenthesis. You type keywords here. It shows all these keywords. If you want to know, if you want to get help for any keyword, let's say I want to know what is false. Wow, it's a detailed information. It says this is a Boolean object. It's a it's an object of class Boolean, and that it, uh, it's a Boolean type, and it gives you all the Boolean features. But if you look at certain keywords, like say, maybe if, it shows it's an if statement. If statement is used for conditional execution. So you can get help about every syntax keyword in Python within the help system, within Python runtime itself. You don't have to look for any external documentation. These are like official documentation and reference guides. If you're a new buy, if you're a beginner, all of these might look a little cryptic initially, but as you start learning more and more terms through my sessions, you go back and read it, maybe after you finish the Python tutorial sessions I complete, all of these will make sense. You will realize it, what they actually mean, right? Anyways, just like your reference for future. And um, 
Within help, you can also get help for various features. You can get syntax keyword help. If you don't know what all topics are available, you can type topics and you get a list of topics. If you want to get help for modules, many standard library modules, you can also type the module name. For example, I can just type module and uh, I can say modules and uh, let's say sys tells you information about sys module. The problem is this uh, module help system is not perfect. It does a scan on my system. Sometimes it can crash. And many times it crashes on my system. It does a full scan on my system to get all the modules. And from there, it tries to look for the word sys perhaps, right? So it's searching for many things. I'm saying I type control C to come out of it. Don't, uh, don't try the modules help as such. It doesn't work very well, especially if you're using Linux or Mac OS, okay? I guess it might work on Windows, but not suitable for Linux or Mac when there are a lot of external libraries being bundled. But having said that, let's come back to the notebook here. So you know what exactly true and false are. I just showed it to you from the keywords, right? The list of keywords. The number of keywords in Python, how many are there? I think they're very less. We just type, go to help here and type keywords again. How many rows, how many, how many, how many columns do I see? One, two, three, four columns. And uh, each column at the least, at the least it's got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 32 plus 33, 34, 35. Looks like there are exactly 35 keywords in this version of Python. By the way, this is Python 3.11. Maybe if you're using 3.12, you'll have another extra keyword, that 36 keyword, which is a keyword called type, which is recently introduced anyways. So but the point is the number of keywords in Python are very less. So you will, you would have learned all these keywords once you start build connecting the dots from all the sessions I'm covering in a while. Okay. Anyways, coming back, I talked about um, the Boolean type. And the Boolean is under the numeric types. All of these are numeric types, right? Um, each of these particular data types, these are called as data types because they represent data. Now, before I even talk about data types, types, I should tell you a little bit about objects. There are two broad categories of objects in Python code, in Python code, in your Python program, when you're dealing with objects. Or what are objects? Objects are entities created in memory, which are identified with a label, variables or identifiers, right? So use them to identify them. So anything that you can identify with a label, with an identifier is an object. I think I talked about that the last class. And objects have a lot of interesting features, like they have methods and attributes. We'll talk about all those aspects in a future session. For now, I should tell you that uh, objects are of two categories. Objects that represent data and objects that don't represent data. All objects that represent data fall into a category called data types. Numbers represent data, 10, 15, 3.4, 4.5J, or even Boolean, true and false. They're all essentially some kind of data. So any objects that have a notion of a value or of data, these are called as objects belonging to certain data types. There are many objects in Python that do not necessarily represent data. Functions are objects in Python. They don't represent data, they represent code. Modules are objects. Modules represent a package of code with functions and other things inside them, right? Modules are like a packaged library, but they're also objects. They're also identified with an identifier, right? You have a module name, functions have a function name, but they don't represent data, they represent code or they represent something else. Even classes themselves are objects, but they don't represent data, they represent a classification for other objects. So these are the other category. There are, these are objects that don't represent data. Mostly they are metadata or other details, the other stuff. But all the objects that correspond to representation of data, they fall into data types, right? Now, when I talk about these data types, we have numbers. These are all the official numeric types built into Python. I also use the word carefully. I said built into Python. What do I mean by that? You can always create your own new object type and uh, you can also create your own new data type. It's possible. It's, for, it's easily possible for us to add our own new data types, add our new custom classes and objects. Python gives you that flexibility, right? But what is by default available 
in the python runtime are called as built in types built in types are types of objects that python can readily recognize without having to load any extra library or without you having to write any code for it so as soon as i launch python runtime it knows there's something called integer it knows this kind of type this data is a flow this data is a complex that's why these are called as built in data types now when you talk about built in data types in python what are they i talked about numbers numeric types let's come continue with this cell we also saw strings s is equal to if i type hello world like this what do you think this is this is a string is a string this s is representing a string object strings themselves there are three categories of strings there are three types of strings not many people know about this many of them who would have self learned python would have skipped this and say strings is just one form of string right reality in python 3 you have this is one kind of a string you can also create another kind of string i'll call this as maybe maybe i'll just call it as you know um Mm, let me choose a nice character for this. Okay, T will do. <laughs> I'm using silly characters here. Okay, don't don't worry about this. Or rather, I'll just use a, a you know, I'll use a byte string. To, how do you say byte string? I'll just use a BST. BST is equal to. I say B quotes. I'll do it. type of bst you can closely observe that i put a small b here and then i open quotes and i typed in a normal string and i close quotes at this moment so when you use a small b this is a literal notation of a byte string okay it is called as a bytes string object literally represented using b quoted strings some of you might ask me what is this i'll tell you in summary for now i'll give you more details when i talk about a topic on string right i'll give have a dedicated session on string following shortly so there i will go very much in depth about the ways you can represent strings what all you can do with it and all but uh, for now i should it suffice to tell you that your normal strings that you see here the characters that you have in the string all these characters they support unicode or rather i would say internationalization or localization uh, what do i mean by that you just you don't have to use just english letters here you can put all kinds of alphabets with different languages if you know their unicode notation for example uh, i live in india right so i can remember some unicode characters some because of my regular trainings and let me just try to see if i can guess it i can try maybe slash u09 Zero five zero slash u zero b four zero. Let's try this. Ah, okay. I need to print. Yes, I print s at the end. Oh, this. You know what that is? This is a ah in Hindi. Oh, what is it for? Okay, I think it's four eight. Is it? Okay. Yeah, no, not for eight. I had to remember that. I sort of forgotten. <laughs> I think it's a uh, zero c. All right. Yeah. I think this is all some glyphs. But you know what? You go to unicodetable.com, you'll get the unicode number for various characters. Hindi characters start from uh, 0905, that much I remember. I was trying to recollect uh, what comes in Tamil and Kannada and Telugu, so yeah, it comes in those numbers, but I think I might be wrong about where it starts, okay? But never mind. The point I'm trying to make here is that if you know the unicode value, you can put a small slash small u followed by this is the unicode value for a character. which means you can represent a string uh with textual data which could represent uh, contents in any language as long as you know the unicode values for those characters you can represent uh chinese characters you can represent even arabic characters the right to left kind of character format so all these are supported right strings are meant for representing textual data mostly for human consumption so we as human beings can read it byte strings however as the name suggest it's a collection of byte values each byte could be anything 
It can be from 0 to 25. Now, luckily, uh, the character's HEL low world from our traditional computing days follows this ASCII character set. ASCII, I think uh, you know what that is, right? It's basically following an ASCII character set. Which is, I think, um, if all the byte value is 65, it shows up as a capital A. Uh, a byte value of 97 will show up as small e. It just follows that, right? So it follows that particular series. And uh, all these English characters and things that we use on your normal English keyboard, I think they all have an ASCII value and uh, it just translates to that. But you can also represent raw data, raw binary data using a byte string. So if at all I want to read contents of a file, the file has got textual data. I can read it safely into a string, but the file is a raw image or an audio stream or a, a video, you know, file or anything as such, or maybe a program binary. All of these are binary file formats. And if you want to read binary file, for, binary file formats, you read them into byte strings. When I talk about file level, you'll see there are two ways to open a file. You can open in text mode or binary mode. And based on what mode you open, when you read, you get a string or you get a bytes object. And uh, there are ways you can also convert between them as long as the contents are compatible. I will discuss that in a session when I talk about strings. But for now, it is suffice to tell you that this is a separate data type. It shows up as bytes. And there is also another kind of a data type, which is called as a, a byte array which unfortunately there's no literal representation. You have to type it like this, byte array of B codes. And uh, when you try to print type of PTA, PTA is the name of a variable I chose to say byte array. So I forgot uh, parenthesis. Okay, extra parenthesis. You can see that here, right? It shows byte array. This type of BTA, it shows class byte array. There is no literal representation for a byte array. To construct a byte array, you have to use the type constructor. This is the type constructor. There's a data type called byte array. So you need to call that type, passing a compatible argument, mostly bytes, to get a byte array. Byte array is similar to bytes, but it's just, you can modify it. I'll talk about mutability, immutability, and all that. Then you'll have some clear understanding. Just note that there are three kinds of strings for now. We just string, bytes, and byte array. What are these? How do they work? I will talk about in a dedicated session when I talk about strings, right? Now, for now, all of these are built-in data types, which I showed you. But it's not all. There are some more types. Um, let me create another cell here for this. I could actually type A is equal to 10, 20, 30. This is interesting. Print A and type A. Class tuple. What exactly is a tuple? If you compare with many mainstream languages today, Python is quite unique. It has a tuple. It has a tuple data type, but I don't see it there in Java, C, C++, or C, and many other languages. What exactly is a tuple? A tuple is a rudimentary collection. It's a sequence collection. Now, to understand a tuple, I'll tell you how it actually works, right, from the layman's perspective. Suppose I have a one object, I have a pencil here, a single pencil, and I have a label. I have a label. I give you this label, a single label, and I give you a pencil, and I ask you to label it. You will just stick this label on the pencil, and you will write a label like this. So you labeled a pencil. Now, if I give you two pencils, or maybe three, right? I give you two pencils, but I'll just give you one label, not two, one label. And I say, label these two pencils with a single label. How can you do it? Well, uh, either you have to stick the label on this one, uh, this is not labeled, or you stick on this one, uh, this is not labeled. How do you ensure that you label both of these pencils? Well, you'll think of an innovative idea. What is that? Well, you will get a box like this, a pencil box. 
Okay, I left some empty open food boxes here. Okay. And this box. You put both these pencils inside this box. You close this box. Maybe you label this. And what is this? This is a collection. This is what a tuple is. Okay? It's a collection of items. What is a tuple? A rudimentary collection of items. Right? But when I simply say collection, I might not make a lot of justice. I would say it's an ordered collection of items. Ordered collection of items. So tuple is ordered. So if you just see here, I mentioned this, uh, you know, this, this pencil box looks very unordered. So this is not the right example. Uh, the right example for an ordered collection. Ah, I have this. This is an ordered collection. I know what these are called in Python world. These are called as sequences. A sequence is an ordered collection of items. Just like this. This is a sequence. Why do I say it's a sequence? Because there's an order of elements in here. So if you and I agree on the order, I can say, uh, which is the first pen? Assuming I'm starting from this side, okay, based on how I'm facing, I'm starting from this side. This is my right side. We say, uh, which is the first pen? Say this, you and I will agree this. Which is the third pen from here? One, two, three. This is the third pen. I think it's green. But say, which is the last pen? This, last pen. So the elements are organized in an order. And this is exactly what sequenced collections are. Sequences are collections of ordered items. Or I can say maybe. I'm not sure if the English is correct. I would say that sequences are ordered collection of items. <laughs> ordered collection of items, right? That's how you say. But what other kinds of collection can I have? Maybe if I just take this out. Right now when I hold it like this, it is still in order. Still in order. There's an order of elements. But when I hold it like this, there's no order. This is not unordered. Because you know, I cannot agree on order because uh, I don't know which one is first element for me and which one is first element for you. This is an unordered collection. Though it's a collection, you have multiple elements in here, multiple items bundled, bunched up together, but it's an unordered collection. This is a set. This is called a set. And Python has ways to represent all these types. Okay, sorry about the mess on my desk. Okay, let, let's be there. Okay, so I talk, talked about the label versus single item. Normally when you have something like an expression like you say a is equal to 10, you have a single object, single identifier. The identifier refers to that object. No ambiguity. It works. You can see that it shows up 10 and it's of class integer. But the moment you say a is equal to 10, moment you type a is equal to 10, comma 20. Now you have created two objects. One object whose value is 10, another object whose value is 20. Two numbers are created. But on the left-hand side, you have a single variable. You have a single label. You don't have two labels. You have only one label. What does Python do? It boxes them into a collection. It creates a collection holding 10 and 20. Representing 10 and 20 creates a collection. And A is labeled on that collection. So therefore, this is a tuple. We also call this as tuple packing. And this is one of the ways you can create a tuple. A tuple is a data type. You can see when I say type of A, what does it say? It says A is an object that belongs to a class called tuple. Some time ago, I think I tried multiple expressions, separated by comma and a REPL, and the REPL showed up in parentheses and told you, don't worry about this, right? Remember? It's a, it was a tuple. So whenever you have a right-hand side expression that returns multiple objects, maybe because the expressions were multiple expressions separated by comma, perhaps, that entire, uh, I would say, set of objects or collections of objects are boxed into a tuple. And tuples are ordered because when I represent 10 and 20 here, the first element is 10 and second element is 20. I may be jumping a little ahead at this point. But I'll tell you a tuple is a collection, it's sequence collection, which means you can access individual items of this collection. And how do you do that? 
using what we call as a subscript expression. I can say a of zero indices start from zero, subscripts start from zero. Zero represents the first item, right? Uh, don't ask me why. There's a this is how it was done in C language, and that's how it's being followed in Python, <laughs> right? It's become common amongst programmers to start numbers starting from zero, not from one, like mathematicians do. Anyways, so the subscript starts from zero here. So you can say a of zero represents 10. What about a of one? Represents 20. And what if I try a of two? What do you think is the answer? A of two. What do you might think? Uh, it should be nothing. But Python has a rule here. You have a collection of fixed elements. You have only two elements in a collection. You ask for the third element. It's not going to go silently telling, oh, it's not there. It's going to raise it as a runtime error. Do you see that? And the error is little unique. It says index error. <clears throat> it says index error, tuple index out of range. So it shows that the tuple has just two elements in here, two items, and you're trying to access beyond two items. And that's considered an error. So if at all you want to access maybe the third item, the upper tuple must have third item also. Then it works without a problem. We'll talk about all these subscripting operations, a lot of things you can do with it much later. For now, just note that a tuple is just an ordered collection of items. There are much more there into a tuple. We'll discuss that a little later. Just similar to a tuple, there is also another collection which is called a list. Let's say a is equal to 10, 20, 30 like this. If I try to print a and type of a, you can see that it shows up a class as a list. It shows up as a list. This is a literal representation of a list. Literal notation of a list. A list is pretty much similar to a tuple. Similar. In fact, it is so similar that in any expression where a tuple is expected, you pass a list, in most cases, it will work without a problem. A, a, tup, a, a list can fully replace a tuple in most expressions. Then why have a tuple when you can have a list? We'll discuss that in the future session. For now, I should say the, the, the keywords are, I should say that tuples are immutable, immutable. List is a mutable object. So mutable, immutable, what does it mean? Don't worry about it for now. You just heard it from me, but I will cover that in the next sessions. For now, just note that all of these are built-in types that can be constructed directly using literal notation, tuple, list, and then we have another type which is also called a set. Sets are created by using curly braces, the braces. You can see that when I use this kind of a character here, I call this parenthesis. Some people call it rounded brackets, but this is parenthesis. That's what I'm going to use the term as. These are brackets. We can also more specifically call these as square brackets. And what you see here, this character represents a brace, right? Braces, we call them. Or some people call them curly braces. So I'll mean the same. Now, when you create a data like this and uh, try to print it, print A and type of A, you can very well see that it shows up as a set. What is also peculiar about a set is the order. I represent the values as 10, 20, 30, 40, but when I print it, somehow 40 came first, right? If you add more numbers, you can see it gets a little scrambled across. The elements are unordered. Remember, I use the word unordered, not randomized, not shuffled out randomly, okay? It's not random. The order is not random. It's just that we can't determine the order directly as a programmer until unless we know the internal implementation of how a set maintains things. So don't worry about that. For now, a set is merely an unordered collection of items. But to be more accurate, I should say a set is an unordered collection of unique hashable items. <laughs> okay, so too much of terms and jargons at this moment, but I will discuss that much later. We will have dedicated sessions focusing on 
each of these data types and what all you can do with them. There are a lot of operations you can perform, a lot of methods you can perform, a lot of use cases. But in this particular session, it is suffice to know at a very high level overview about what are these types and how what Python, uh, what are the built-in types in Python and what how they represent them using literal notation. And the last built-in data type I should talk about is not last, I believe, last but one, I would say, uh, is a dictionary, the most commonly used data type. And there are many ways you can construct a dictionary, but there's a literal notation of a dictionary where I can type something like, say, name Jonathan place. Let me choose a place, random place. So what do I think? What do I think in my mind? Denver. Okay. And uh, let's say age, and let's say he's just about 25. Looks like a nicely organized record. And what is this? It's a key value pair. This is a key value pair. And we call this a dictionary. You see what it shows here? It shows up as a dictionary. So when you say D is equal to open curly brace, there's a key, which is a string, by the way. You have a colon here, followed by a value. This is this is one pair of keys and values. Name corresponds to Jonathan. Place corresponds to Denver. Age, 25. So if you want to represent some kind of a key value record set, you could use a dictionary, right? More about dictionaries a little later, but for now, you should note that these are all the kinds of types that Python supports as the built-ins, right? That's all the built-in types supported by Python. All right. Now I told you about all these types and the last one I should talk about is a type called none. You know, we, you've already seen that. Uh, that is, if I, just, if I all try to say maybe <clears throat> n is equal to none. And if I try to print type of n, it shows it belongs to a class called none type. None stands for nothingness. If there is an expression that does not return any value, what kind of expressions don't return a value? Maybe mostly I can think of as functions. There are certain functions that are meant to be invoked as statements, not as right-hand side expressions. Print is an example. You never say A is equal to print of hello world or R is equal to print of hello world. You don't want to use print as a right-hand side expression and get the written value of print. It has no outcome. These are functions designed to be used as statements, not as right-hand side expressions. Such functions return none. In case you forcibly call it and the right-hand side expression try to get the return value, the return value is none. I think I would have told you that I would have talked about this much earlier. I will just demonstrate this in a cell all the way below. I'll try to say R is equal to print of 10 plus 20. I said R is equal to print of 10 plus 20. When I run this, print prints the result of this expression. First, the expression is evaluated. 10 plus 20 becomes 30. Print prints 30 on the screen. But then, what about the value of R? Does it return anything? Let's try and check it out. We'll say print R. This is written value. Print returns nothing. It only prints what you pass as an argument on the screen, the standard output here in this case, but it does not return any value when used as a right-hand side expression. So that's what none is. None has other use cases, which I'll discuss later. For now, this covers all the built-in types that you should be aware of. So let me summarize what the built-in types are right here. The built-in types are built-in data types, okay? What are they? Int, float, complex, boon. One set of building types. I'm just going to put them in particular order like this. One set of building types are these. These are numbers. And then we have string types. You'll realize a string falls into another category, which is uh, sequences. We'll discuss that later. So we say str, bytes, byte array. And then we have further categories, another, another category, which is tuple list. And we have a set. 
I'll also put dictionary all together, no problem. All these fall into one compound category, anyways. So all of these are, and, and the last one is none. So all of these are the primary built-in data types in Python, right? Now, one of the common things that we, people do is that sometimes we want to convert types. Before I talk about type conversion, I will tell you the use case for it. If you want to get input from a user, see so far I told you how to print something on the screen by using print function, right? It looks like details about print will be on the next session. <laughs> but for now, I'm just telling the basic use case. So it's a print of when I say hello world or anything, it just gets printed on the screen. Like you see here. This is how you can display something from your program. If you want your program to display any output, you can use a print function. But what if I want a program to get input interactively from a user? If you want to get input interactively from a user, if the program is running on a command line, the best way is getting command line input is like prompting for input. So user can type it on the keyboard. To get user input from the command line, you could actually use a function called input function. And yes, if you use input function in VS Code, Visual Studio Code, or if you're using Jupyter Notebook, it works a little weird because input is meant to be used in command line oriented applications. What are command line oriented applications? Programs that you run in your terminal, in your terminal. These are command line oriented applications. Your terminal or your Windows Anaconda prompt or command line, so you can run it from there, right? For example, this is a command line oriented application. This Python prompt is getting user input. Just like the Python prompt is getting user input here, how do I write my own program to get user input? I'm going to show it to you now. This time, I'm going to create a separate file. I'm going to run that file, and I'll show you what happens if you do something like that in the Jupyter Notebook, right? So I'll create a new file at this moment. I'll just call this as new file, new Python file, and in this Python file, I want to get input from a user and greet the user. So I'll just type uh, name is equal to, or I can say username, Let's make it more specific. Username is equal to, I can use input. Input is a built-in function in Python. So you say input of, you can use a prompt string here. I can ask, what is your name? And now, uh, you put all the, I, the user type something. I want to greet the user. For that, I can just greet. Hello, username. Welcome to Python. Good. That's it. A simple greeting message. I have to save this file because I opened a new file. If you remember, open new Python file. So I need to save this file with .py extension. I'm going to save this file under a name. Let's call this greet.py. Greet.py. You can do the same thing like I did here. What do you what I did here? Let me remind you. I did file, new file, selected Python file, which opened up a new tab here. And in the tab, I just typed in these lines. And after that, I clicked on save. The shortcut is control S or command S if you're using a Mac OS system. So once I've done that, you can just put this two line code, the very basic program that we wrote. And I'll try to run this. In order to run this program, you must be, you must have saved this file in a particular location. Remember, I think I created this folder called Python samples, session one, session two, I think I did that. Python samples, I'm saving all my files in here. Make sure you open up your Anaconda prompt. Uh, you must be seeing the Anaconda base prompt like you see here. And make sure you are in that folder. And to navigate to a folder, I think you can use the command called cd change directory to that folder. So in this case, I'm not sure if I'm the folder. I'm not. So I'm going to go to CD. I'm just going to type Python samples. Tab completion really helps. So you have created a folder called samples on your own. You can navigate to that folder in your command prompt. If you're using something like Linux or uh, Mac OS, the shell there, you can type PW to find out the current working directory. If you're on Windows, you can just type CD. CD and enter will show you what is your current working directory on Windows command line. 
But on Mac command line, if you type CD, it'll go to your home directory. <laughs> Better be careful. You have to type PWD, right? If you're using Linux or Mac OS on your shell prompt. Remember, all these I'm running at the shell prompt. I'm reminding you this again and again so you so you don't miss it out. Typing all these commands at the Python shell prompt, that is a triple greater than prompt, will throw errors, syntax errors mostly, right? So I just did PWD, I'm in Python samples. If you are using Linux or Mac OS, you can type ls command. If you're using Windows, you can type dir and see what's there inside. You should be able to spot greet.py. Type ls. Uh, by the way, if you're using a Mac OS uh, or Linux, you type ls. If you're using the Windows command line, then what you should type? dir at your shell prompt. And then when you type there, you will see all these files. You'll see greet.py. If you're able to find, you're, if you're able to spot this file, greet.py, you can type Python space greet.py now let's observe it's prompting for user input the input function is expecting input from us now as a user so i can type any name i can just type my name chandra i shorten names let's say it says hello chandra welcome to python coding it works so able to get input from a user as a string this is a string. Whatever the user types, that is read into a string object. And then the username will identify the string object. So what does input do? Input prompt for user input. Whatever the user types, is it just allocates string object, storing what the user types. It stores it in a string, in memory. And then the username that's in the left-hand side, that, that identifier or the variable, is better refer to the string object. Username now refers to whatever user typed at the input. And now you can see that I'm able to print hello followed by the value of that particular username. What is the value that username represents? It represents this, what you type, dynamic, right? So prints a username and says, welcome to Python coding. Looks good so far, right? But what if I want to, let's say, get number from a user and want to do certain math maybe i want to let's say uh, you know find the area of a circle i want to find the area of a circle so if i want to do that i'm going to create a new file now file new file this time python file and this time i'm going to save this file save this file i use Control s you get the save as dialog box where you can just Try to save it as circle area dot py. Circle area. And now I want to get the radius from the user and then calculate the area for the circle. Well, I'll just type radius equals input of enter radius of circle. I mean, I'm not asking what unit it is. It could be centimeters, it could be inches, it could be feet, it doesn't matter. It's a number, whatever number it is. You can also make it even more better where you can take it in uh, a specific unit and convert it accordingly. Let's keep it simple for now. So I'm going to take the radius from the user. I want to compute the area of a circle. The area of a circle is, you can say area is equal to pi r square, right? So how do you do pi r square? Well, there is no value called pi, so we can approximate it by using 3.14. Later on, I'll tell you there's a math module which has math.py constant defined. Actually, it's not a constant, it's an identifier which you treat as constant, which you can use, but for now, we can just leave it at 3.14 at this moment into radius, into radius. You can also say into radius to the power of two. It's all fine. I think for simple square, I can use it this way. And then I can try to print the area of the circle is area. This is a program, a fully functional program, but it has a problem, which you will see now. I save this file as circle area.py and I will try to run this. I, I went to the terminal where I am in that particular folder. I can see that there's a file called circle area.py visible in this folder. Now I can try Python circle 
area.p1. So far, so good. It's asking, what's the radius of the circle? Let's try a small number, let's say 5. Maybe it could be like 5 inches, let's say, or 5 centimeters, depending on what unit you want to use. So when I press radius as 5, the area should have been computed, right? Ah, something went wrong. What really happened? It says, can't multiply sequence of non-int of type float. It threw an error here. You can see this, the cap symbol. It shows, uh, you know, you can see trace back most recent call last. It tells you the file name, what line number, line number two, area is equal to 3.14 radius radius. There's a problem with the multiply operator here. What's really wrong? What's really the problem here? The problem here is that input always returns a string. You should also note, this is the case since Python 3.0. The Python 2 version, the world was different. <laughs> the world was totally different in Python 2. So I will I will not want to bother you with Python 2 uh, relics anymore because you shouldn't be using Python 2 in 2024. Okay, it's 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 dead and it's rotten now. <laughs> it's rotting. So you want to use Python 3 for all purposes. In Python 3 onwards, input function always returns a string. Though I type a number five, that five is a string. It's not an integer. You can we can very well verify that by just printing radius and type of radius. You can also see some interesting thing I'm showing you here. One of the best first line of troubleshooting as a developer is when in doubt, use print. When in doubt, use print. What I mean by that, you have a problem in one line and I realize there's a problem with radius. Hmm, the radius has some issue. I was not able to multiply with radius. Why I was not able to multiply with radius? I started to print it. Is radius getting in, is is a radius uh, value being fetched correctly? Let's print it. So by adding a lot of print statements like these, you could quickly fix issues. But when your code gets a little larger, uh, this is not really suggested. For small snippets of code, you could use print. When in doubt, print. Okay. So for large larger code, you should have some kind of a logging framework enabled, where you can turn on logging and start reading the logs, which I will discuss the much later stage. But now you can see as a print radius, type of radius. And now if you let's try to run this again uh, at this moment, I'll type, the, I'll type radius as five, repeat the same number, right? Uh, enter radius of circle five. I printed the value of radius, it shows five, but what is the type? String. You can't multiply a string with a number. String cannot be multiplied with a floating point number. You can multiply with an integer. I'll talk about that later. But for now, float into string is not compatible. That's why you got a type error. What do I do now? I need to convert that input, which I got as a string, to floating point. How do I do that? Well, you could actually do this. You could actually say directly here, float off input of enter radius of circle. Float looks like a function for us. It looks like a function. I'm calling float. To float, I'm passing result of input. So function call inside a function call. It's like a nesting that you see here. This might look a little counterintuitive at the first time, but this is a common practice that we always use. I'm gonna explain what happens in a while now, okay? In the Jupyter notebook rather. For now, I just put a float of input of enter radius and everything is going to work just fine now. I'm going to clear the screen. Control L works for shell prompt also, by the way. And now if I try to say Python circle area dot py, you can see, I'll type five one more time. No problem. Area of circle is 78.5. You can see that the second line, 5.0 class float. So what happened? Well, this is called as a type constructor expression. What is the type constructor expression? You are constructing an object using the type itself. See, when I say a is equal to uh, 4.5, it's a print type of a, what does it say? It says class float. In Python, there are built-in identifiers to identify all the built-in types. 
there are built-in identifiers to identify all the built-in types in Python. So what are they? See, there is something called float in Python. That's a built-in identifier. Float is like print, right? Print and uh, len and all this. this is an identifier. It identifies something. What does it identify? It identifies a built-in type called float. It identifies the class called float, by the way. We just try to pray, say print of float. You can see what it prints. So there is a type object represented as float. There's a type called float. There's a label called float that refers to it in Python. It's already prepared. Python has it as built in. All built ins are predefined, right? And you see it. You can use this to construct floating point objects dynamically. One way to create a float is you can say a is equal to 4.5 like this, right? You can do that. This is a literal representation of floating point from which float object is created. But consider the fact that I have a number like integer like this. This is an integer. Let's say print, uh, if I just say print a, type of a, class integer. If at all I say b is equal to, if I try float of a, print b, type of b, shows 4.0, class is float. I will tell you one of the very common misconceptions that happens on, it has happened on the internet. I've seen far too many tutorials, even YouTube videos, where people wrongly call this, wrongly call this as type casting, type casting. This is not type casting. Mark my words, this is not type casting. This is what we call as type construction, right? This is type construction. And not type casting. To understand about type construction and type casting, I should tell you something. Casting, what do you mean by that? It's like this. The word casting is like, the best example I can think of is uh, an analogy of film actors. You know, in one movie, an actor is cast as a hero, as a main person. In another movie, he could be a comedian. And yet another movie, you could be a villain. <laughs> Same person, different movies, different roles. That's called typecasting. If at all I have an object in memory and uh, sort some data, not, I'll not even use the word object at this moment, some data in memory. I want to see, uh, initially the data is created as an integer type. But I want to see the same data as floating point or maybe as character type or something like that, something like that. The data is same, but I'm seeing in a different view based on my context. That is typecasting. And typecasting is a feature found in statically typed languages, moreover. Because you typeify variables, you define a variable of type integer, and in most of your modern programming languages, integers are generally four bytes. Or is it eight bytes? It can be yeah, eight bytes. So if your integer is of a particular fixed length, maybe eight bytes, let's assume. But for some reason, I'm not interested in reading the entire eight bytes. I want to read only the lower four bytes or lower two bytes or lower one byte of that integer. I create another variable where I'll cast it to the lower one byte of this existing data, right? That's called type casting. Use that car or int common in C. Most people look at that and look at this and they say it's the same thing. It is not. Here, you're creating a completely new object of type float, copying the value from integer. There's an integer object who's got a value four. Reading those contents, reading the value of an integer, another object is created, which of type floating point. The value also is four. So the two distinct objects. You constructed a new floating point object using the value from an integer. As using the value, the value is copied internally. So there are two copies of uh, objects in memory here. 
there's one object which is 4, which is an integer, another object which is float. So you have both A and B, both are independently there in memory, right? So this is a constructor expression. So what is this? I'm constructing an object of a new type. Whenever I have a, an identifier that represents a type, I have an identifier that represents a type or a class. I can call it like a function. The moment I call it like a function, it instantiates or I can say constructs an object of the type. Okay. It's like, you know, we call this constructor expression. If you come from C++ background, I know what a, you will know what a constructor expression is. If you want to come from Java background, you will wonder, where's a new keyword here? Oh, you don't need new keyword in Python. You just call a class like you call a function. A new object of the class is created. A new object of the class, of the very class, is created. So all types can be constructed by calling them like a function. And most of these types can take arguments if necessary. So to determine their values, the initial value, right? So for float, you can pass an integer as an argument and it creates a floating point reading from an integer. It also works with a string as long as the string contents are, you know, compatible. So if at all I have a string like this, where I say s is equal to 5.6. Sorry, s is equal to 5.6 here. s is a string holding a value 5.6. And now if I try to say, um, f is equal to float of s. I'll try to print s, type of s. I'll try to print f, type of f. You know, all these things so I'm typing so far. I recommend you people to try it out, okay? You might see me all typing on the video and <laughs> going fast, but just I'm um, digressing here and telling you. All of these things, you have to practice. Everything you try it out on your own and check it out. Verify it for yourself. Until you verify it for yourself, you can't be 100% confident on how it works, right? Just try all these things out. If you want, pause, pause the video, try it out, come back, try variations, you'll learn more, okay? And you can see this. So you can see that when I say s is equal to 5.6, I'll represented a string using literal notation. And now this is a type string. As long as the string has data, which looks like a floating point value, you can always create a floating point out of it by using float constructor. Float of s is going to read the ingredients of a string and creates a floating point. It creates a float. On, on this float, you can perform arithmetic operations. You cannot perform any kind of arithmetic on a string. Remember, you cannot add, subtract, multiply on a string. Python is strongly typed. But the moment you convert it to float, how did you convert it? By constructing a new float object using an existing string. How was float created? The float is created by constructing a new float object using an existing string. Most people mistakenly call this typecasting. Wrong. It is not typecasting. Somebody says, uh, talks about a tutorial and say, uh, this is how you typecast in Python. Point them to this video. <laughs> Let him learn. Right? So this is type construction at play. This is a construction or constructor expression just like any classes. So float is not a function, float is a type. So when you call a type, you're constructing an object of the type. Okay, so be very clear with this. So uh, I talk about these things. Uh, here I told you how we can create a float, but what if I try this out? If I try maybe not uh, 5.6, but if I say maybe um, ABC, this is a string, definitely not a floating point. What if I try to construct a float of a string which has some non-digit characters like these? You could you could start with a digit, like say you can say 5.6 like this, followed by A. That's enough. Can I create a float out of this? Nope. This will raise an exception. You can see that it raises a value error. It says could not convert string to float 5.6A. Why could not convert? because it found a misleading character here. It doesn't know how to handle it. And the error is very interesting. You can see it's called a value error. The type is okay. You give me a string as an argument, I'm happy with it, but the string should contain the value which I can create a floating point out of. You know what I mean? 
That's exactly what float is expecting. So here, whenever the type is okay, but the content that the object represents is not compatible in any expression, then in very likelihood, you'll get an error called value error. If type is incompatible in an expression, you get a type error. But if the type is okay, but the value is not compatible, you will get value error, right? So you should know this. So this is something that you should know about types. Did I spill over? Oops, I did. <laughs> I have to continue the next session again. So I think it's almost like 15 minutes off one hour. So I will continue more about type constructions and so on in the next session. I think I gave you some insight about input function, right? Now, here's a quick exercise for the people. Small exercise before I finish this. Let's try this out. Create a program. Python program. To convert temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit. I'll tell you all these exercises which I'm telling you right now, these are not something unique or things like that. You have to exercise discipline where you can go to any resources of like Wikipedia, any place, Google search and find out uh, how do you convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. Find out the formula. Then on your own, try and write the program. On your own. It's like playing a game, right? If you use cheat code, it's, there's no fun. <laughs> If you, got the, if you go to chat GPT and type this, you'll get the answer. You'll get the complete Python code. No fun. You're not learning. You're making chat GPT learn. You're adding more reinforcement to it. No, I want you to learn. And how do you learn? Try it out on your own. When you try it out on your own, you will struggle for the first program that you type. But that struggle should not demotivate you. That's how it is. Imagine the first time you sat on a bicycle and you fell down two or three times. Or first time you try to jump into water, try to learn swim and you try to drown and somebody had to help you out. <laughs> That's the same feel when you learn programming the first time. So if you're trying out this as a first program, try with all effort on your own completely. Just know the formula for converting search to Fahrenheit. Just get the formula. Just like you find the formula for finding the area of a circle. Say, maybe there's a formula for that. Get that. Try to see how you can get the user input, right? Get the Celsius value as user input. Convert to Fahrenheit, print it. This is the first step. If you're able to do it like this, fantastic. You have managed to figure out the Python syntax, right? So that's how it is. So try this exercise out. More to follow in the coming sessions. As and when I have some interesting topics covered in this session, I will give you more exercises for your tryout. And if you are able to find the answer to the exercise, or don't post it on comments, send it to me by email. <laughs> Or at least say on comments that I have found it. Okay, so I was able to solve it. That'll, that'll be good. All right. And if you're stuck with something, let me know. Always comment. Uh, the, you can always comment to me on any where that you're stuck. And uh, yeah, as usual, like, share, subscribe. Right. Let more people know about these videos I make. Thank you very much. So hope to meet you in the next one.